I decided to manually drill and tap the vise. So we're going to come back about here and uh, just line this guy up and and we got our center punch mark and then we're just going to come back and drill it with a manual drill and uh, well not manual but a uh, cordless and uh, drill and tap. Alrighty so we've got our center punched hole here and I'm going to use this drill guide just to keep things perpendicular. I guess uh, this little stubby uh, drill bit here, I'm going to have to walk it out a little bit. Just trying to keep it hunkered up. So these jaws are, even the back piece is hardened. <laughs> here I thought it was going to be a lot softer. This first drill bit size is undersized. Uh, here is the tap drill size. I purposely went with an undersized drill just so I'd get a good pilot hole that's straight. And this thing only is in uh, fractional size, so I went with one of the fractional size that fits. Okay, next up, just tapping, 1032. So we're just going to tap it, and this is pretty hard stuff, so hopefully it won't be too bad. I think they uh, case hardened this uh, metal because it gets softer inside, at least it feels like. Hands getting tired. Fine threads. Lots of revolutions for a little forward gain. <laughs> That's what we were worried about. Call myself lucky, but uh, there was enough tap sticking out that it wasn't so bad. Thank God it broke back a ways. That would have been a nightmare. My beautiful brand new ish Kurt Vice. I guess it's six months a year old but still that would have been really horrible all righty i can clean out the hole and then we need the belleville washers they'll put pressure on it and uh, we'll be good all righty so last but not least we're gonna put the make the rear piece for this live center so that it can be ejected from the tail stock properly this morse taper is about 52 thousandths per inch taper so we're gonna make the cap, but we're gonna taper it. And we're gonna make it about four tenths of an inch deep. That's it. But I am gonna leave a little button in the middle, uh, just because uh, that'll help it eject a little bit sooner. But if I have it stick out too far, or actually make a tang, then I waste some of the travel of my uh, uh, tail stock. So I don't wanna do that. So this piece actually has the center portion cut out for me partially already, which is really handy. So I am just going to turn the outside. And we're gonna start with the largest diameter. Brass is really easy to work with, but it's such a messy material. All right, I'm just gonna face the end of this guy off here. Okay. So I guess as long as we're out here, we could cut the outside taper and then do the inside. So the open end is the smallest diameter. The far end is the largest diameter. So let me set my uh, compound to three degrees, which is, it's actually 2.99 something, but very close to three, so we're going to do three degrees, which will make it just a little bit smaller, which is no big deal. 0.420 of an inch from front to rear, and it's going to taper from the rear at 1.010, which the whole diameter is now, 2.988 with a three degree taper. So now using our compound, we're going to dial this taper in, and the total is 22 thousandths that's got to cut them off. So um, I'm going to find my zero here and uh, we're going to dial that x zero so we're going to want a total 22,000 let's just start with the uh, let's just do 20 thousandths since this is brass so another way to do this would be to look where it stopped tapering, and that should have been roughly 0.4 inches, huh? Oh, ha, ha, ha. Half angles. That taper is taper per inch. I don't know if they meant, they have may have meant by that, that's the total angle. I'm not sure. So, this is a 
drying that I've uh, kind of spilled some alcohol on so it dissolved the uh, Sharpie. Uh, this is from the engineer's black book. And uh, they're talking about taper per inch on diameter. Oh, 0.2 and change. I think I needed a half the angle. So this will extend that cut region out roughly double. Much better. Oh yeah. Okay. So we've got the outside taper. Now we can cut the inside and we've got to cut that fairly closely. Ha! I was so concentrated on getting this taper right, and this would have been fine if this end was closed up, but I was thinking about using this opening already, uh, but that's a screw up, because guess what? Uh, this opening here uh, needs to be on the other side, on the large side, because that's where it's getting pressed on, and I really should cut the taper going the other direction so I can hollow it out all from this side before parting it off. That was kind of silly. Uh, a screw up on my part, so I'm going to part this off and I'm going to make it again. All right, here we are going to try the taper again. This time I'm going to taper and go in the most here and come back out. So I've got the one and a half degrees the opposite direction. We're going to touch off. And that should be my zero. And then we're going to go in. I want a total of 22 degrees. Let's start with uh, 20 and come out. And we almost make it, which is perfect. That's exactly right. I'm going in 0 0.4220 here. Okay, so let's go in the last two thousandths. And I'm gonna try and go slow and even here. And if I did this right, it should just stop cutting as it gets to the end, right at the end. And that looks perfect. All right, we are there. Okay, next up. So you, I don't know if you can see it at this angle, but it's tapered. Instead of being straight, see they're straight. It's tapered coming out this way, so it's tapered like this, just one and a half degrees. I'm going to reset. We're going to bore out the center. To resquare my tool post, I'll be stealing a Quinn Dunkey uh, over a Blondie Hacks uh, method for getting it really close very quickly. Just make sure I don't run into anything here. And uh, just push my tool post without, of course, having any debris in there. Against the face of my chuck, which should be good. And that should put us very close to square. If I needed it more so, we'd have to indicate it in, but uh, that won't be necessary at this point. Okay, so next we need to bore a hole and we need to be a total of 0.939 on the inner diameter. So let me go grab a uh, end mill and we'll use an end mill to get most of the way there. So once again, I'll be using my tailstock DRO that I built a long time ago in one of my videos, if you want to find it. Um, I'm going to be using a tailstock DRO to control my depth. I need 0 0.310. We're going to do 5 eighths. This is a center cutting end mill. I figure it's brass. We can get away with this. Leave myself a couple thousandths for the uh, boring bar. So that gets most of the material out of the way. And we'll come back and we'll bore the rest. First pass, we're going to take 125 thousandths off. Fortunately, this part doesn't need to be very strong. This part just needs to hold on to the tail, onto the uh, live center, and uh, then it'll be pushed on. 
from the rear. So that'll push it right into the flat portion of the live center. So it should all be good. Okay, so that's already starting to go. So with a really light tap, that's gonna go in. All right, so the little nubbin I stick off the back just needs to be smaller diameter than this uh, tang here, which is 0.433. So why don't we shoot for 0.4? Uh, that'll give it something to push in and it'll push a little sooner. Just make sure my zero is good. Just lightly touching. Oh, right on the money, perfect. There we go. So here's our part. So it's tapered going out this way to the largest diameter over here, smallest diameter over here. It's got a cylindrical internal hole that is about a thousandths undersized. Whoops, almost dropped it. And then this little nub in here uh, is, sorry about the bounce, this little, this part sticking out here is smaller than the uh, Morse tape or tang that normally fits in there. So that'll fit back and it'll just push a little bit sooner, that's all, and give it a little more meat to push on. Alrighty, so let's uh, deal with the uh, first two parts of this project complete. And whoops, knock that right on over. Uh, here's my live center, and I don't think it'll damage the bearings. I'm gonna tap pretty lightly. Besides, this thing is a really nice fit. So I'm just gonna get it lined up, and... Uh... Boy, that went on nicely. That's a pretty good fit. So there's what it looks like on, and it ended up just slightly small of the actual diameter. You can feel it with the fingernail. Uh, let's head over to the lathe and see how the fit is. Here's my tailstock, and part of my problem was that my tailstock DRO clamp, I made it fairly thick, uh, three quarters of an inch, so I lose some of my ejection space here. And also it's in the way of putting something between here and the live center to eject it and just retract that back like a one, two, three block. Uh, that's another solution, but I can't use that very easily because there's only this slight area up here to do it. And it, you can do it, but uh, this is just more convenient. So this is a Royal uh, live center and it fits really tightly into the tail slot. Look at that, it locks immediately. What a beautiful fit. And before it would start pushing this aluminum bit off of here before it ever ejected. Uh, now, there's just touched and popped right off. There we go. Well, let's call that a success. And it's kind of pretty. So fourth solution, also good. Like I said, we have the screw solution. We have the Morse taper solution. We have the cap solution for a cylindrical hollow center. And then this one that had no, uh, just a little detent in the end, really. Uh, this was a better solution still. Next up is the mounting plate for the Wilton vise. Got these screws a really nice length. I didn't have to trim them. I thought I might have to, but I had some screws that were on pretty close to on the money. And I can rotate this guy out of the way to mount it. I want it roughly centered between these two. I purposely didn't put the screws all the way up against both sides because I want some rotation range. Uh, because what I've got to do is, is I've got to take this guy over to the surface grinder put this up against the fence, and then use an indicator and go along the edge here. With this set at zero degrees, with the bottom set at zero degrees, or I guess in this case right on 90, I need to have this thing lined up perfectly, uh, or even zero degrees. Uh, well, if I get one right, the other will be right. I'm just gonna soft tighten these for now and 
head over to the surface grinder and show you what that looks like. Alrighty, so here we are at the surface grinder. And the base plate that's squared off, I've got it lined up and touching across its length on the rear fence, which is also lined up. I've got the hash mark on the 90. I don't know if you can see it. It's pretty dark over here. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of precise, it's going to be tough to get that super precise, but that's what we've got. And then I've got the rear jaw. I tightened this uh, set, this Allen screw over here, left this one loose, and started tapping this guy around till I got it fairly close. We're within a few tenths across the uh, two inch jaws there. And uh, based on the hash marks here, that's probably accurate enough. So then I tightened this guy down and we are good to go. Now I've got this guy lined up. I can spin it, you know, 90 and use it to uh, cut my tool bits or whatever else I'm gonna cut on here. It does compound angles. It's got angles this direction, rotates this way, also rotates this way, and it rotates on the base. Pretty handy. Next up, I'm gonna replace the bolts in the rear vise jaw, or the fixed vise jaws, on my Kurt vise. Be handy if this was open a little more. And we're gonna place the screws with center tapped and threaded, or center drilled and threaded bolts. And that altered nothing on the functionality of the vise in normal operation. But what it did add was the ability to, oh, <laughs> I used different threads. Wasn't that brilliant? I didn't have very many 1032s and I decided to buy some. I used 1032 on the side, this is 1024. So uh, what this allows you to do is fixture things up inside the vise here because I can use screws inside here on both of these guys, which is pretty darn handy. As a matter of fact, because the head of the Allen is smaller than the half inch bolt, I can just leave them in and leave them recessed like that. So if you want some great ideas for how to use these with various fixtures, go over to Tom Lipton's site and check out at Ox Tools and check out what, what he does. Here's a close look and I've left the Allen screws in. Those are one inch long Allen screws and I left them inside the half inch 13 bolts. And I'll just leave them there so the chips don't get stuck in the threads. Uh, and they're below the surface of the jaw so they're not gonna interfere with anything. When I need them, just loosen them up and uh, use away. Alrighty, so we're ready to mount this guy on here. Uh, but before we do, um, I, I need some way besides just the screw to uh, hold this guy in place because if I use just the screw, then it's gonna wanna slip down like that. Uh, or you tighten it up so much that it's hard to move and the first time you move it, um, it's a problem. So I wanted to way, be, have a way to create continuous friction and resistance against motion. Uh, and so my solution is to use Belleville washers. Now I've got assortment down here of different Belleville washers for this size screw, this 1024, and uh, they vary in the amount of force that they can apply. This one's 87 to 163 pounds, 34 to 55, 46 to 81, 45 to 67, 60 to 110. And so basically they get thicker the more force they apply, obviously, because they need to be stronger. And sometimes they just get larger as well. Uh, even though, apparently they come in a range of sizes, even for forces. Now, to illustrate this a little better, here's some larger ones. These are quarter 20. And uh, with Belleville washers, they're cupped. So they're basically a giant spring. And uh, they're kind of neat because uh, if you want different effects, you can add them together. So if you want to make it even stiffer, so if this was, call it 100 pounds, which it is, um, and I stack two of them like this so that the cone conical sections uh, nest inside each other, then this is 200 pounds force up to uh, when you tighten it down. If you flip it the other way, they're both still 100 pounds force total, but the spring distance basically makes my spring longer. So if you need a longer compression range uh, with the same force, you can just stack these up. I could stack another couple and vice versa. I'm gonna start with the heaviest Bilbo washers here, the 87 to 163, and I'm gonna put two of them back to back, not because I want the range so much, but because I want the conical section to press 
the, the point of the cone to push against the edge there to possibly reduce some of the friction. That may not be necessary, um, but it's what my first thought. Well, you know what, we'll start with one and see how it works. Originally, I was gonna go for the longer range because that puts the pointy part of the cone up against the surface, which seemed like a good idea. Uh, but let's just start with one and see if it works out. Maybe the friction will be in the right range of what I'm looking for here, which is to have the, not have to fight it, but have the part stay up when you're trying to use it. <laughs> That's a cheap Allen screw, isn't it? All right, so there's plenty of friction. I'm gonna need to Loctite this so it's loosening it up as I go here, but <laughs> it snapped. This is a uh, inexpensive Harbor Freight ball end and uh, just snapped the end right off without any warning either. It uh, didn't get particularly tight. So we're gonna have to get that out of there. The other consideration is that if there's too much play here, see the flex in the spring? Um, if I was trying to use this as a reference surface and I pushed up against it just a little bit too hard, um, I'd, be, I'd have inaccurate measurements. So that's another factor uh, that I've got to take into consideration. So what I'm going to want to do is to find the right tension, which I think is something about like this, and then I'm going to want to Loctite this in place, and I'll make it removable Loctite. I might go for a slightly smaller one because I noticed that some of the smaller washers are pretty close in force to the 163 pounds that this one's capable of, minimum 87. So we've got here, so we've got 60 to 110. That's a pretty small little washer. Uh, I, I like the fact that it's not going to overlap a little bit more. By the way, if you're wondering, I got these in a master car. They cost on the average. Uh, about, um, what were they? They were, they were about 50 cents each, I guess, if I remember correctly. So they're not cheap, but they're a very useful tool and they can be used for situations where you have a lot of vibration and you don't want your threads to back out because it'll keep tension, fixed tension on the threads. Oh yeah, that's plenty of friction, okay. So we're going to Loctite this guy in place and we should be done. Last but not least, I want to set up a zero on my DRO. And I'm going to go to zero number 99 for my case. And we're going to make this my zeros. Let's uh, find my zero. Let's go over 100 to compensate for the 200 thousandths diameter call that zero. Let's do my Y. Go over a hundred thousands to compensate. Now the point here where I just touch both, if I can get there, That's within a tenth, and that's within a tenth. Perfect. So now, just to check that theory, all right, so why don't we test this guy out and see how accurate it is. I don't expect it'll be perfect. I mean, the side of the curd is probably fairly close. Um, I expect it to be reasonable. I don't expect it to be hyper accurate, um, but let's give it a test anyways. I mean, the main purpose of this is you want to throw something quick in the vise, drill a couple holes relative to a corner, and uh, it'll help you out. One interesting thing is that the uh, vise jaws, the Kurt vise jaws that came with this, are slightly inset from this outside uh, steel portion here. Uh, there's a couple, like maybe a 10 or 15 thousandths gap in there. And uh, the beauty of that is, is even if whatever I'm going to try and reference off of has a slight burr, it'll fit in that gap. So that's kind of a nice feature that was never intended. Uh, so I'm just gonna slide this guy over there and in case it's not flat, I will stick a piece of welding rod in there and uh, make sure that this is uh, fitting in there nicely. And we'll just measure. So let's see what we get. So 
So that is about 1.7 thousand, so that measured 101.7. And this direction. About 101.3. So it's about off by a thousand, thousandth and a half in both directions. And for quick jobs, that'll be plenty accurate. Just got to make sure to get it in there right. Um, but that's always the case with any sort of... Uh, uh, vice loading operation. You always have to be careful. Uh, I kept the uh, heavyweight Belleville washer in here and so there is not a lot of slop here uh, when you're pulling this out and I did that on purpose uh, because I wanted this to be as accurate as possible. I didn't want if you slid this the uh, the tool the uh, part too heavily up against this that it would deflect and give you a false measurement which it's not so that's great. Um, anyways, so about a thousandth, a little over a thousandth accuracy. I'm very pleased with that. Gives me a good uh, another option for the future. Again, I got this idea from Tom Lipton over at Ox Tools. Definitely check out his channel. Great channel. Lots of tips. Uh, he, yeah, I, I don't know if he had his on the jaw or on the, the rear uh, fixed jaw part of it or the removable jaw. I can't remember now, but I remember seeing it thinking, wow, that's a really good idea because you can just set your zeros and go. Anyways, uh, this has been a very interesting project, and I hope you at least found something I did useful. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time.